None of EPM Partners, Bob Kendall, or any of its officers, directors, employees, other personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors is, in such capacities, a licensed financial advisor, a registered investment advisor, or a registered broker-dealer. None of EPM Partners or its personnel gives investment or financial advice or makes investment recommendations, nor are any of them in the business of affecting trades or directing client equity accounts or giving futures trading advice tailored to any particular client situation. Nothing contained in VPN Partners broadcasts on its websites or in its written materials constitutes a solicitation, recommendation, promotion, endorsement, or offer by others described above of any particular security, other investment product, transaction, or investment. Copyright 2014, VPN Partners, all rights reserved. Terms of use apply. Reproduction, adaptation, distribution, public display, exhibition for profit, or storage in any electronic storage media in whole or in part is prohibited under penalty of law. Good morning, everyone. I think we're going to have to get something other than ACDC to start the show, huh? Uh, it's getting old. Anyway, um, Monday morning, a lot going on. Um, where to start today? There's, uh, with the uh, market action right now, they're, they're penetrating through the new lows. We're at 92.60. Mitch and I were just talking about we've penetrated the extreme projections for the day, and we're also below the S2 number on the weekly already. So we're, we're seeing quite a bit of selling right now come into the marketplace. Uh, just kind of reviewing some of the things that were covered in the commentary just to, uh, to talk about some of those things. Uh, the whole idea of the Fed being irrelevant. I really, uh, I was telling Mitch, sometimes hindsight's a great tool, huh? That's, uh, <laughs> and uh, the, the bottom line is I realized when I was doing the commentary and looking at the action last week, the action in the markets rallying had nothing to do with the Fed. It had everything to do with unwinding these big programs under uh, quadruple uh, uh, expiration that happened on Friday. In fact, if you look exactly when the sell-off started on Friday after printing into all-time new highs, it happened right as the September futures went off the board. And the second those things were done and unwound, the uh, market just started unwinding. And of course, we had the, the, the talk of the town, Alibaba, and uh, that was going on as well. And so there's a, uh, I think there's some influence there. Uh, it's actually broken 90 last time I looked. And, but the bottom line is, uh, the reason why the Fed's becoming irrelevant, the messaging under Yellen so far is just becoming a mess. I'm not, they're, they're not doing a very good job uh, at the transparency. The whole transparency concept is, uh, I think, failing. And the, the realities of everything that's going on from the standpoint of of uh, market action we're seeing uh, you know this has been the big dilemma i've probably talked about for the last two or three months now is who's got it right the bond market or the or the stock market or the market participants in stocks and you know it's we're continuing to see uh, a divergence in attitude I, I i saw a really interesting story earlier this morning that i thought uh brought out some uh, some interesting thought so while interest rates went up in the last two weeks and we printed all the way up to the 262 level well if you were in frankfurt or in anywhere other than the u.s the u.s dollar was going straight up so the benefits was in because the dollar went up more than the bonds dropped in price you were actually positive at owning u.s bonds so the the yield differential was attractive and the dollar going up makes the bond market look pretty darn good and that was probably why we saw some of the backfilling on the bond market on on friday a little bit and so but i still think the things that we talked about last friday and last monday we'll go through a review here shortly but i still think those are the same things that are happening on the uh, markets from the standpoint of looking at uh, the treasuries and what they're doing they're still projecting up and we've got some barriers 268 272 we'll talk about that in a little bit uh the other thing is the alibaba uh 
offering, which has got to be the biggest sucker play on the planet, I would think, especially anybody that paid 99 bucks on that thing just to get in on the opening the other day. It's like, uh, uh, it's the FOMO, uh, fear of missing out, is yeah. uh, drives drives so many people, it's crazy. It's, uh, you know, this, this is all of this stuff and the reason why the the whole concept behind VPM is what is what why we do what we do I guess is is staying out of FOMO you know uh, that that fear always drives you to do all of the wrong things maybe the market's going down you think it's going to turn you're buying cheap or you're staying in too long or, or you're buying too early and it's really there's really not a lot of benefits in there and those of you who watch Friday show maybe we'll review a little bit because it really was revealing when I brought up a portfolio expert and showing the different allocation strategies 90 10 all the way down to 60 40 uh, what those really meant relative to just protecting assets and stair stepping over time so um, I guess we had housing come out this morning Mitch something like that I think it was uh, yeah, we did. We had the, uh, the existing home sales come in, and the consensus was supposed to be at uh, five, uh, 500, or 500, 5.18 million. Uh, the actual was 5.05 million. Uh, so a month over month change of minus 1.8% when they were expecting an increase of 2.2%. So that was a pretty, pretty substantial miss yeah. on that one. Yeah. Uh, and this is, this is a story, folks. We've been kind of beating on this, and, uh, you know, is that any of, the, for instance, the Builder confidence numbers, which is a survey, is at the highest level since 2005. Meanwhile, all of the numbers coming out of the actual market are terrible, terrible. And in fact, I, I talked about this on Friday, local numbers here in uh, primarily in North Scottsdale, which is a, kind of a, a, the upper end of, of the market here in, in the uh, Phoenix metro area. And we're looking at uh, prices are down uh, inventory has has nearly doubled and sales time is up about 30 percent there's about nine months worth of inventory on the markets right now and I talked to a buddy of mine that's a realtor and he was telling me that it's just terrible out there as far as selling anything you thought okay uh, the kids are back in school maybe a few people will be willing to move but there's there's just uh, the activity is just continuing to slow down and we live in an area where People like to get out of Minnesota and come out to where it's really nice, <laughs> and uh, so uh, the snowbirds will be here shortly. Maybe there'll be I some. Bet. There'll be some Probably increase. early this year. Yeah, <laughs> uh, maybe there'll be some some uh, increase in activity with uh, folks that are typical renters that want to maybe uh, get a get a more permanent uh, place out here. But that's not going to change things from the permanent residents and things of that sort. And. I suspect seeing these numbers across the country, this is continuing. So the, the whole thing is, if, it, if it's a survey, it's probably gonna be better than expected. And if it's reality, it's probably gonna be worse than expected. And um, that was the other thing talked about is bad news will become bad news. And maybe today was uh, bad news was bad news. And then also with all these unwinds went, there's literally no reason. And I talked about this on Friday's show is that there is no reason when the market was printing 2019 the other uh, on, on Friday morning to own this market. There, you can't come up with a reason. You can't come up with an economic reason. You can't come up with, there's nothing. And uh, it was just really kind of a hype. Uh, the Scottish vote was supposedly, you got some sympathy bid out of Europe. Uh, you know, that's, that's not it. I read an article that now there's a pretty good movement 50 it's supposedly the poll is 51 percent of the people in texas want to to uh, get out of out of this country if they do i'm moving back my wife's texan so we're going back home uh, so to speak <laughs> if that happens but you know but the bottom line is the separatist uh, movement is happening at a lot of places and that and the fact that this uh, the scots decided and it was actually the the city that decided that vote was pretty pretty much uh, a lot of folks on the dole and uh, they got promised a lot of things and you know i'm not sure uh, i didn't follow it really close enough to to know uh, almost nothing so you know other well, than one of the things that in regards to the, the scottish vote that, that i thought was interesting was the the age uh, difference as far as uh who who voted which way and i think it was 72 percent of people above the age of 50 voted to to stay yep. and 72 percent of the people that were 
I think 18 to, to 40 or something like that, voted to leave. I will have to admit, I, I was on BBC Five uh, listening to it at uh, uh, midnight our time, so early in the morning, mid uh, middle of the night in uh, Scotland. It was kind of interesting. They, had, they did have a bunch of these kids on that were all, yes, there was one out of the whole group that was in a no vote. So let's move on to the markets, unless we got anything else. Uh, so much for the Scots. But uh, the, the, whole, uh, the whole concept of even discussing that is this is things that the talking heads will tell you is happening. The realities are is that's not what's happening at all. Uh, what we were seeing was the unwind of these big programs that were out there. And now we're seeing the reality uh, in the marketplace that there really is no reason. And the, the other thing, uh, I'll switch over to the, to the market screen now. Uh, the other thing that's happening is uh, no one wants to own this thing over 2000 yeah. It hovers around there and boy, they're out of there pretty quick. Uh, and this is a, a good sign I'm trading all the way down to 9211 so far today. So uh, I'll go to the uh, screen so I'll get out of the way so we can see all the numbers easy enough. And the, uh, what, what's going on here as far as, as the numbers were continuing to be just flat on all of this stuff. Um, one of the things that I talked about in, in, in commentary last night was what you see uh, over here, and I'll just draw a couple arrows here just to, so you can focus on this. Um, so let's see here, let's see if we can bring this up. These, these spots right here, so this was the 2084, I mentioned these in commentary, 2084 to 20, uh, was it 2084 was the minimum number. The extremes are 2125 and 2150 from the standpoint of, of what's going on on, on uh, a projection. This is the Fibonacci projection. This came out of this pattern. The problem with this pattern and, and these objectives is that we're seeing a, of course now with the downside, we're seeing that the PPMs one, two, and three over here on the right-hand side are are declining and losing momentum quickly. So it's very hard to get a high up, uh, objective on the upside like this without some kind of, of trend. And this is the thing I discussed on Friday that there was absolutely zero trend kicking in. There was no evidence that any short-term trends, even going down to an hourly graph, you couldn't find any short-term increase. And that was one of the problems, even though we printed a historical high, you know, here we are right now, we're, uh, what, almost 30 handles off, uh, off the top already, just like that. So we printed 19, 2019, 26 on, on Friday. Now we're, uh, 1993, 99. So we're, we're just, uh, off of there. Um, and uh, from that standpoint, the uh, the the concepts that I, I want to continue to discuss as we bring up the VPM market mind uh, information on the screen here as we do these shows is that there's two. You can see there's upward objectives and downward objectives, and the downward objectives are still valid. From uh, uh, actually, they, they were invalidated on the the close. I talked about this the other day when we made this new high. These, these arrows, I got all kinds of arrows here, uh, but this is this little cluster right here. These stopped calculating because we made a new high and that pattern was negated. So we we're at that time, we were looking for a 1924 plus. What has to happen now to generate a new pattern will be a breach of the 1978-50 number and then a move down to, uh, then that will signal uh, a further move down and it'll, it'll probably be something similar to this projection that's on here but most likely will will continue to be um, you know will be down into this region because the patterns are similar it could actually project a little lower numbers and uh, when we go through the intermediate charts here in a second you'll see that the big there's two big numbers on the screen right now uh, uh, 19 1978.50, which was last week's low, that's huge, and then the big number, the giant number on the bigger scale is 1904.70, which was the lows of last month, and these are going to be pretty significant. I actually like the action. We'll we'll talk about this here. Uh, we'll move on to the 
intermediate charts here and the in the intermediate you're going to see uh, you'll see this uh, a couple things here as I get out I'll get out of the way here for a second and you can see these these PPMs and the PPMs are 0 0.08 0 0.27 0 0.23 we were printing up uh, when we were at 2010 plus the other day this this middle PPM 2 was around 0 0.30 uh, we're still in trend mode hanging on by uh, a very little bit here but one of the things that is is happening and this is the what, we're, what we'll see on the weekly chart is what I've been talking about on the monthly chart when I go to the next chart here to review that as we'll see the slowing down of the angle of attack of PPM1 and PPM2 will continue and there's ultimately a train wreck that will happen which will be a crossover and the crossovers will probably occur at a point where the market has stretched down and right now that that those levels that are on the screen right now is the 20 let's see here um, we're looking at 1977 is the 10 weak moving average right now so there's a lot of potential uh, downside if we break that then the next number is 1957 so it's very possible if we reach that 1950 level that we would see a uh, we would see a minor load at that level we'd get a bounce back and then probably sell off to retest that like I said I it's going to be I think nearly impossible for the markets from a technical standpoint to avoid ultimately retesting the 1904 level. 1904 holds when that we get down there again. If that holds and we bounce again, then maybe there's some uh, possibility of a continuation on the upside. But I believe as the weeks and months are unfolding here, that probability is becoming less and less from the standpoint of, of, the, uh, of any type of sustained rally. And I strongly believe, and I, I, I keep saying this, but I'll say it again, uh, I strongly believe that we are probably, if not this month, within the next three months, we will have a major high formed and that we will start a decline. And it's interesting, I was just looking at my CNBC app this morning on my phone, realizing that the 12-month low was like 1660 or something. So it's 400 points lower than where we were just one year ago on the S&P. And I thought, huh, that's interesting because that wow. would be about a 12 to 15% drop if we just went back and took away this last year. Whether you want to believe it was fluff or whatever, um, for the most part, most of our selling that we had in the last several weeks happened at different levels if you want to relate it to the, the S&P between 1920 and 1960 range, which is where most of these, these came on. And thanks AJT for the 17 number. That, uh, so it'd be a 17% decline to get down to there. And that, that's, uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, that's a strong possibility. And there's even more uh, to this thing. So let's take a look at, um, let's take a look here at the monthly. And I'll get off the screen so we can see these numbers a little easier. Uh, we're right at 1% now, so we need to be below 1992-91 to get this PPM1 below 1% uh, over here, and that is, um, that's a key number. If it was back up at 108 on Friday when we were at, at the uh, 2010 level, so it's pretty sensitive right now. It was 99 just a few minutes ago. We were trading down closer to the lows. So this is the pivot point where we are right now is in 1994 level to start to signal this crossover. But if you look at, see if I can make this a little bigger if it will do what I want it to do, sort of. Uh, these PPMs over here on the right, you're seeing that uh, they're crossing over their first and second derivatives. The same thing with PPM2. We're right at the crossover point and the PPM3 is 105, it's already started to, to decel over the last 
you know, last several months. And now you have to remember that each one of these bars is a month. So it takes several months to really have these things happen. But my guess is that we're very similar to drawing some arrows on this chart here, just so you can see exactly what what's going on there is this is this was the the top that we had in 08 and we're starting we're at the very beginning stages we're probably within see I think I can do a, a square here well I'll just draw a square around it but this region right here we're within this bar structure of seeing a breakdown so there was about four bars in there so I'm calling, uh, you know, uh, you know that the uh, the sky will be falling certainly sometime in the next four months or so. Uh, you know, if, if like I said, if it hasn't already already started from that standpoint. I'm, I've lost my cursor somewhere. There he is. Just in time for Christmas, right? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so it won't be a Christmas rally, but. There's quite a few seasonals that come into play, but I, I think uh, if you look at where the tops happened in, in 2007 and eight, we were, that was a November high. Yeah, I was gonna say 2007 is what jumps to my mind when I think about uh, the, the Christmas rally that didn't happen. Yeah, it, it, it failed by the time it got there. And, and, and a similar thing that was happening, uh, maybe we should bring up uh, VPM 2.0 here and, and talk about this, but the same thing, that death pattern that I've talked about before, we're having fewer and fewer stocks participating. Here we are just printing a, a new high on, uh, on Friday, right? And, and we've already, you know, we're seeing only 39.8% of the stocks bullish at this point. And this is uh, just an ominous uh, sign of what's about to come. And it, these stocks, uh, and when you look at VPM, from a trend following standpoint, that means that 60% of the stocks and the mutual funds and everything that's in this database are not trending right now. They're even flat to down. As we pointed out, the uh, I believe it was NASDAQ and the two uh, Russell 2000 has about almost 50% of the stocks are down 20% or more. So there's already the argument for some is that uh, there's an internal correction happening. I believe it's uh, continuing. Uh, if you look at what is the Russell IWM, I think. Can you look that up, Mitch? I think it's. No, I, look it up. I think it's IWM. That that thing was crushed on Friday. It was down one and a half percent, and you know you were down one point eight on the week, and uh, you know today it's actually I've, I believe it's lagging a little bit. We're, it's not as down as much, but it was leading again, and I still argue that the 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 thing that got us up. Is going to lead us down, and that these these small caps are going to go uh, uh, pretty uh, continue to decline. And if there are higher rates, uh, there's something in the note of about four and a half trillion dollars in 2015 that has to be uh, uh, down. I believe it's down 1.4 percent on on that. Um, and the uh, the the pers this whole scenario that's happening. And I, I know it was at a conference in 2011 or 12 that I was talking about that the final rally is going to be the is going to be large cap led. And that's what we've got here. I mean, this is purely not only large cap led, but it's starting to get to a very narrow phase of, of the markets from this standpoint. So um, it is IWM, by the way, IWM. That's what I thought. Yeah. So. When you start to look at, at, at some of these, I think I've got a better view here. Um, IWM, real quick here. When you look at this chart, uh, this, is, this is a very classic uh, 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 pattern here. And if it breaks down below these lows here, then this thing is gonna roll over. You got a double top. So the key number is going to be down here on IJR at 109, let's see, 107.44. It's currently uh, 112. So it's got a ways to go. But it breaks down below that level, then this whole pattern is broken. And chances are you're going all the way back, maybe even into the highs here that I'm, 
I'm bringing up, the high would be uh, 86. And that, now that's a big number uh, from one, 107. That would be about that 17 to 22 percent decline. And I think once that happens and the, and the, the patterns are broken on these markets, that you're going to see a much different attitude and the way that these stocks trade. Uh, I don't think we have the elements around. Certainly, after 2001, we had we had a lot of disruptions with the 9/11 situation, but we also had the dot-com burst. And I believe that there are a lot of things. Alibaba is just a sign of of the market's being stretched so far that people would pay 99 bucks for that thing. Uh, like they had to get in. Uh, there were 50 billion or 50 million orders in balance on the open the other day. It took them, what, two and a half, almost three hours to open that thing up after the initial offering. Institutions had to be loving it. It made almost 40% on their money and they hadn't done anything. What a, what a great deal. Uh, uh, some... Somebody came out there, but there was 200, uh, 271 million shares traded. Uh, I forget what the turnover is, but it was uh, well over, two, uh, I think, 200% turnover of the float. It was just crazy, just everybody trading in and out. And the institutions held it at, at uh, the, uh, that level. But the point of this is, is that the, the Russell, uh, the small caps, uh, I guess we could take a quick look at the... Uh, the cues here are going to look uh, similar. Whoops. So we can come in here. This is a little different look uh, from from that standpoint, but we're looking at the uh, we're coming up to a pretty critical level here on on the Nasdaq. I'll bring up this this chart here so you can see the numbers. But the there are no current upward objectives. We've exceeded everything. And we're starting to see the same. I can see the moving average rolling over where we're coming into that crossover. And that that number there is 9807. Uh, and we're uh, pretty darn close, 9880 on, on this on the queues right now. So we're very close to breaking that down. The next number is 95. So that's a uh, roughly a 2% two, uh, 2 plus uh, type uh, decline at that point. But you can see that these moving averages are starting to fade away. So let's go over uh, over here and let's take a look at a couple other things. Let's take a look at a, uh, let's go to the treasuries real quick here. And you're going to see, I think this, what I was talking about the other day, we're seeing the treasuries back at 255 here. And this is the daily chart, so you can see it's rolled through its 10 period moving average. Momentum is still pretty robust, but it's, it's in a little corrective phase. And this bid that we're seeing in the treasuries coming back in again is most likely due to that, the, the same scenario we we're just talking about. The dollar was uh, down overnight, but it's, uh, you see it right here. We're up uh, just a few ticks right now. Uh, we're at that 8480 level and we're we keep printing it it's interesting because looking at flopping over to the dollar real quick we're looking at an objective here on the on the upside get that up there uh fibonacci objectives right now of 87 to 89 and we're currently 84. so we're looking at another five percent on the dollar and if yields drop and the dollar keeps going up if they, this bid keeps going on the the bottom line is that the uh, the markets will be uh, uh, this market will continue to have a bid just because of the foreign interest and I've talked about this for a while and when you start looking at, at some of the the other elements here and looking at the uh, you know the bond is still around one percent you're you're much better off buying U.S. Treasuries having an in increasing dollar and and then having this going. I had the opportunity way back when in 1980 to work offshore in the markets and it's a much different view on how you look at the U.S. markets when you're sitting overseas and you have currency considerations and other things. We we don't think about those things here often but they, they have a big impact especially as the world has evolved a little bit since 1980. That was a long time ago, wasn't it? 
Uh, yeah. So, but anyway, but those are those are the kind of things that that uh, that are happening here, and that's what's causing this treasury bid. Going back to treasuries, just real quick here. Here we go. Uh, let's go to the the weekly the weekly graph here, just so we can we can take a look at the intermediate trends on the treasuries, and we are 0.27 positive bringing up this uh, PPM down here, uh, down below, you can see, uh, um, get the numbers up here. And this thing is not showing right now, but it's 0.27, minus 1.5 and minus 2.7. So there's still some downward pressure above this market, which is at the Two, uh, right now, 250, 262 is the big one. We got up to 262.9. The 40 period moving average declining at a trend level down is at 262.24. So we've hit that last week and we bounced off of that number. So this is probably going to set up a right shoulder where we would come back into the uh, 250, 252, maybe 248 level. And then if we see some stability, that's, that will be the point where we'll re-challenge this 262 level. And I've talked about this range on treasuries. It's 2.62 and the 268 level. Those are going to be key. And then above that level, it's really the next level to really be concerned about is all the way up at 3%, which is uh, every bond trader in the planet is watching that number. And if we even get close to I think if we get over 272, there'll be a capitulation of this. And I still argue that one day we're all going to wake up and realize that we can't pay off the national debt at 18 plus trillion now. And if you ever went to the debt clock and watched that thing tick, it's pretty scary uh, how much money is disappearing as, as fast as it, it can. And and uh, I guess on, and the other situation here, like I, I said on Friday, it's going to be interesting as the Fed continues to exit this QE program when they're not buying any bonds at all to see what that how that affects the the sentiment on the auctions and that won't be until probably November when we'll see we'll start to see those effects maybe even in December auctions that we'll see but the amount of money that has to be raised every month just to keep uh, this thing floating right now is pretty intense and maybe as long as this U.S. dollar situation and the differentials are like they are, there'll be plenty of a bid coming from overseas to uh, keep this thing going. But this this looks like to me that we're going to backfill. Maybe 252 is the most lo logical place, the extreme 248. And we should see another uh, rally back on that. Um, let's see here. We covered the Qs. We covered uh, some of the index stuff that's out there. We're looking at... Um, the the monthly trend here we are back at 99 again so it just below 94 is the pivot point on the uh, uh, I'm right above my head here it's uh, the PPM one is 99 and we're so just below 94 is enough to trigger that thing under one percent and I know that we had a number if you recall probably about two weeks ago the uh, 1991 60 number was a key number we got 92 11 so far today uh, we probably well, uh, one of the things we haven't looked at I'm going to go over there real quick here so take a look at some of these these uh, tar these rates here's the five minute futures it's interesting that cycle came in right as a high so we're not due for another another cycle low probably until close to the close today so there might be a little bit of a bounce. We'll have to see how this thing acts in the closing hour. But my guess is if we close under the 9730 number, which was the extreme for the day, we're going to see uh, some follow through tomorrow. And what we've been seeing uh, from the configuration market, let me go over to the hourly here. You see the hourly graph. Uh, we had uh, we had a cycle. What? Look like it'd be a low and it's failed. So this next cycle low, uh, this this is not going to happen for. Let me see if I can get this number. Another 28 hours from from when this happens. So we're talking about sometime a couple hours before the market opens tomorrow. There should be an another low happening from a, from a, this is the 24-hour futures chart. So we should see some spike, but we're not seeing any 
real volume or any any uh, excesses here to point to a low and so uh, this pattern looks like it, it's intact as you can see we'd have to go all the way back here on the uh, on the 14th of September is going to be the key number down at uh, 1988 on the on the future so it, it's not that far and it won't take much to get there so the the futures charts are setting up to tell us that we're probably going to be under pressure into the close we might see a, a slight rebound if this cycle comes in on the five minutes should come in we had a lot of volume distribution go on right at this top this is a pretty big cluster down here on the right right hand side where my cursor is and this is this type of action is what you want to look for when you when you start to see some of some of this these excesses come into the marketplace so you can see here this is one there's a, a smaller one and then you have a distribution over here where was the uh, the beginning of, of this rally here but this decline has had a massive amount of of distribution going on you can see right here on this this little cluster and that that tells me that this is pretty significant and that it's likely to while we should see a moderate rally back that it's likely to continue uh, to to the uh, uh, to the downside overall and it's basically being driven by some of these other other charts these longer term charts uh, haven't looked at the webs want to go over to the international charts that I talk about all the time to summarize the final part of the equity uh, section here today is the, the the spread differential we're seeing a slight uptick we did see uh, monster new lows again on this index I'm still gonna argue until it, uh, I guess until I uh, till I'm right <laughs> I, don't try that with your wife it, uh, the, the booby prize is not good um, but uh, winning is not always the best thing but this 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 will be the point when you start to see a turnaround in, in this market uh, when when this chart turns around like I said before I've, I've brought these up many times is the chart on the far uh, left hand at the top is 2009 and this this trade has been intact for a while and I mentioned also that I think it was uh, midweek last week uh, I was watching uh, Squawk Box Europe and I finally heard the first guy looking to start to buy emerging and sell against the S&P so people are looking to put this trade on and once it turns it's going to have momentum this is uh, five years this spread spread to be unwound this is a lot like some of these carry trades that you've seen over the years where there's a, a lot of activity uh, the, the yen has had had these type of flows and once the these flows end they end for a while and uh, currency trades are interesting the typical cycle in a currency is between five and seven years and this is a, a very similar type strategy because it's really a combination of a currency and and the, and the market market uh, uh, combination here and when this thing rolls, I'm telling you, it's going to roll, and it's, there are going to be outflows of the, from the U.S. when this happens to continue uh, for for some years. It's going to be a, a multi-year situation. Now, does that mean the stock market is going to go down, straight down? No. What it does mean is it's just going to be uh, squaring off of these books, and this was going to be a trade. So what it will do is it will keep the cap on the market on any rallies because of, of the opportunity people are going to want to sell strength and put these spreads on at the right point. So I grew up in a spread trading world, so it's an interesting way to look at the markets and, instead of having outrights on everything. Hey, Bob, I, and this is, I, I'm glad you brought this up today because I've, I've had a couple advisors ask about this. So as far as how this trade is, or this, this chart is generated, uh, tell us again, just break down real quick what the components are to, to give us this negative looking number. Because I've, I've had a few advisors just ask, so I thought it'd be good just to touch upon okay. yeah, the bare just, basics on it. Yeah, it's a, it's a differential, a spread differential, a point differential between EFA and the S&P. So okay. if, I, if I bring up um, uh, the, the symbol, you'll see I have EFA on the first one, which is long EFA. I could flip this and it would be straight up, by the way. Uh, and then data two is the SPY. So I've got the SPY against the uh, EFA on here, 
which gives you a spread. So sometimes what you'll see if, if these markets are really, really weak, you'll see people put these on in ratios. So they'll do uh, uh, two shares of EFA against one of, of, of the SPY, or two, two, in this case, you do two SPYs against one EFA. And that's where you put this trade. When you flip it, if you were aggressive, you'd, you'd flip that as well. But typical, this is a one-to-one -one ratio type, type chart. And, uh, and the other chart is just the, the opposite here, which is, uh, I don't want to format techniques, hang on, wrong, wrong chart, wrong box. So if I go to a format symbol here, you'll see this one is just a EEM versus SPY. And this is a, a point differential chart that, I, that I've got here. And if you look at the, uh, I guess I could bring up the, uh, the techniques here that are being displayed. And you can see I've got spread differential. You can also do a ratio, which is a divisor. This is just a point differential that I'm using on here. It gives you a little clearer number than, than trying to put it on, on a ratio. Maybe I'll put a ratio on one of these shows. We can, we can talk about this. And um, Mitch was unaware of some of the things that I, I see when he's not here. I, I was really uh, rattling on about market mind and what uh, uh, those of you that want to try the VPM market mind, as I said, just a, just a quick intro into this, is that send us an email that you're interested. We will get you the files, which we'll, we'd like to have a small, like little beta group, you know, five or six of you to get started just to make sure the, the files go out before we stick our foot totally in our mouth. Uh, they should be fine, but we want to be able to get this these files out and and get that going. So if you're interested, send us the email. And uh, then the, the other plan for this whole project is that we have process warriors, which we have not done a show yet for a while, several months. Uh, we're also going to do market warriors. And market warriors is going to be primarily about using VPN market mine, but it's also going to be an educational uh, session as I do uh, complete brain dumps on uh, on uh, technical bar counting and patterns and all the stuff that I talk about all the time. So it'd be an opportunity for those of you that want to learn some of these things for to be out there and, and having the platform to uh, do things. But primarily, initially, it's going to be about VPN market mine, utilizing the tools that are in that, in that, uh, in the indicators and all the different elements that are there. And then ultimately, utilizing some of the other things such as uh, trailing stops, profit targets, all kinds of things that you can do inside a trade station. You can't do in in um, in VPM. VPM is more of a, a a purist trend approach. There's some other things you can do, and I've had some interest. And I'll share some of the the things that I've found over the uh, over the past uh, s several months, uh, re reacquainting myself with uh, Mark of mine. So send us a email to support at VPM Partners going yay I want to be involved and we will get you involved and then we'll we'll try to set up a, a meeting of some sort to to get you going there uh, and part of that group so I did that on on Friday Mitch I, I think there's a couple emails that that are out there okay uh, Mitch you, you got anything for me I'm hoping you you can save me here I'm well let's let's go through the dashboard or the database we haven't gone through that oh yet. yeah that's true I've just been going on and on You've just been I? going all right well go An ahead animal, so. yeah so now we'll go ahead and go through the database and I'll I'll let I'll let Mitch uh, take over the show for a minute all right so let's uh, let's actually jump over to 2.0 first off and we'll take a look here we did see some orders this week I have it tallied up that we had 1,657 total orders on the weekly models. Uh, so we had uh, 739 cells, 919, uh, 918 buys, which gave us a net 179 buys. And uh, you can see that broken down right here when we go to the model overview section here under the all stats. Uh, give me one second while I just load this up. So there you go, as, as Bob had mentioned earlier, we're still at 39.8% uh, uh, long at this point. So we are still a little ways away from that 42% number that we had been at before. Uh, so we're still fairly defensive, depending on what type of security you have within the uh, your portfolios will determine how heavily invested you're gonna be at this point. So what we've seen consistently uh, across the VPN portfolios is most index-based portfolios, your, your 
ETF or your mutual fund strategies are heavily defensive, whereas the stock portfolios, depending on what types of stocks that you have, will determine how heavily invested you are. Obviously, the small and mid caps have been really struggling this year. So a lot of those uh, portfolios that are almost uh, filled primar uh, primarily with uh, small cap and mid caps are going to be largely flat year to date, whereas the large cap portfolios uh, that have those, those large cap positions that are still uh, generating new highs, uh, positions like Apple, those are, are likely still going to be fairly long uh, at this point. Uh, jumping over, let's actually take a look here at the, uh, the sectors. And so when you actually look at the, the stock breakdown, uh, I believe we had only seven, uh, when, when all is said and done between the, the various buys and sells, we had a net selling of, of seven stocks uh, across the board. So when we, we take a look at the, the breakdown based upon the groups here, you see that we had some fairly heavy selling in utilities. Um, and we also had some fairly heavy buying in just a couple in a, uh, a couple groups. Interestingly enough, we touched upon earlier the home builders. Uh, we did see some more buying take place in the home building uh, s sector where uh, we had 18% of the stocks in the home building group uh, just go long this week. Uh, one of the other positions that I know has made the news lately has been the, the brewers section, which you'll see here, beverage brewers. I know there's been some conversation going back and forth between Anheuser-Busch, uh, Miller, Budweiser, uh, those companies uh, that are now these multinationals as they're, they're going through various different trying, buyouts right they're now. They're trying to get Heineken, I think. Is yeah, that's and it sounds like Heineken's pushed them off. But uh, regardless, uh, almost all those multinational uh, brewers uh, we had buys on this morning. So uh, we did see some activity today on that that space. Uh, as I mentioned, though, most of the most activity that we saw again was in in mutual funds this week. So we're we're seeing over the last couple of weeks that almost all the activity in the database uh, has been focused on the the mutual fund side of things. You see that we had additional selling in the commodity sp space. Uh, we're now seeing a lot more of these talking heads coming out, talking about uh, the breakdown in gold as it continues to, to decline. Uh, the buying that we had this week, if we go over to the U.S. equity fund section, you'll see that we had some new buys come in for the mid-cap growth funds as well as the small-cap growth funds. So we had a 12% and a 16% uh, purchase in, in those spaces. So chances are if you have... Uh, some some pretty common small cap or mid cap names that you may have seen one of those positions purchased in one of your portfolios this week. Uh, again, we're still fairly defensive in it. You can see at most on the mid cap side, uh, we're now about 40% invested in all the mid cap mutual funds. So still, most portfolios uh, were, were largely out of, of those spaces on both the small cap and the mid cap side. Yeah, and I, I was noticing we also had some buys in the small cap as well, the small growth. And some of those stocks, maybe those are the ones that uh, are starting to, to bottom a little bit uh, from that standpoint. But it, like I said, the, the overall exposure is like 20% of the, the funds out there. So there's not a, not a lot going on there. Right. Yeah, I mean, to say that we're, we're seeing some more buying, it, it's, it's still, it's only 20% of the total funds uh, that we're tracking. Uh, so there's 80% of the mutual funds in that space that we are not long at this point. And uh, that continues to meet to, to remain the case. Uh, on the weekly research side of things, I noticed that on the uh, weekly emerging market position, EEM, uh, we did see a, a new sell in that, that position today. So if we scroll down this list, you can see some of the sells that we had. And we'll, for the sake of time, go right to the, the bottom here, the major markets. So uh, we had touched upon a couple of weeks ago, the daily, uh, the optimized daily trade system for EEM had sold off a while back. We're finally seeing that, that subsequent selling in EEM uh, with a nice 5% gain on this, this ETF. So at this point, uh, both the, all the various different versions of, of global equity strategy, uh, the different iterations, pretty much you're, you're only seeing SPY long in those, those portfolios at this point. So it really, it continues to be the case that everybody's talking about the S&P 500 because that's really all that there is to talk about because all the other indices, all the other uh, segments of what's typically in a portfolio have been really lagging year to date. Yeah, and, and I, I discussed that in uh, quite a few, uh, quite a bit of detail on Friday about you know that that participation, and we we talked about that earlier. 
Yes. So you've got what the international or the the global at a glance. glance? Not much to talk about there. Um, I think there was only one country that actually changed from uh, positive or from negative to positive uh, last week, which uh, was our friends up here in Norway. Uh, just barely eat eked over to be positive. All the rest, it's been pretty much more of the same as we're seeing additional losses in the, our, our headlining countries in Europe, uh, as well as Asia with Russia. So it's, these markets are all still struggling, uh, even though we are beyond the, the vote for uh, the Scottish independence. Um, at this point, there's still just an immense amount of weakness taking place as, as the rest of the issues with Ukraine continue to get sorted out. Yeah, I think uh, in the final 10 minutes or so, uh, did you have anything else? That's pretty much No, that's, uh, that's it for right um, this week. What, I, what I'm thinking about here is going back to uh, Portfolio Expert and take a look at, um, if I can get the right one, I'm going to get us out of the way here. All right. Um, but, the, uh, but I talked about this on Friday, so those of you who didn't make Friday's show, this is um, I believe Global Equity 4 I have up here, is that right? Correct. Yep. Yes. So this is the Global Equity 4, and, and Mitch and I were talking a little bit about this before we came on. But, and the, the blue line, let me get my, my uh, arrows out here. And what happens here, and th this is interesting, so this goes all the way back just to 05 on this particular chart that we're looking at. So this being the zero line here, at 05, you're looking at 130% gain using just a standard doing all the trades as they're put out on Global Equity 4. And if you did the buy and hold, each one of these colored lines, so the blue line is the S&P, which is, you know, like holding holding the Vanguard or the SBY. And then each, inter, each uh, line down here, I'll draw in arrows, to each one. You're, the green line is 60-40, we're 70-30 on a purple, 80-20, and then 90-10. So the less equity exposure you take on, the less returns you get. And now all of a sudden you're 65. If you, if you did everything from the 2005, you're up 75. If you did the, the global equity uh, four, you, you actually were up 130. And and the key element is always is always this strategy, which I point out all the time. And we're seeing this this range here, and it started um, when the when this last rally went. What I put here is the arrows of of um, the stair stepping. Right? Yeah, the stair stepping of of the equity versus this. And what what's happened right here in this little band right here the markets have been flat so the indexes are playing a little catch up because they're continuing to move up so this this differential gap here between the two has has moved up just a little bit and what all the, all that's happening is when you're in these stair step modes and you're protecting so BPM is going to make money and then it's going to protect what it made um, and so it's protecting that equity so it's it's flatlining here waiting for the next trend so with this particular strategy right now we're 20 percent in. there's virtually no downside even if the market rolls over even if the s p decides just to uh to crash out at this point in time we're going to get out of that thing and there'll be no exposure so the downside is going to be minimal the the uh beta is probably um less than 20 percent even though that's the uh the exposure right now and so you know you're looking at a flattened out curve but so this is this is what happens in in these situations as far as it's going well all of these charts if we go down we'll we'll break all hard even as 60 40 to some lesser degree but you can see in 08 they were all almost the the same there was virtually no differential and they they pretty much tracked each other on the rally up but then you can see um interesting enough um you know the the exposure to bonds didn't pay off as much do you have a comment there Mitch? yeah i do uh, so a couple different things with with this chart when we're looking at it um so first off these are not just simply 60 40 uh market to, to cash we're, we're using here is the the 10-year 
uh, for this. So it does represent a, a bond component to it. Yeah, 60-40 bonds. I didn't make that yeah. clear yet. So uh, one of the things to keep in mind is, you know, what we saw here, especially in, in 2007, was the fact that, that the market, uh, the, even though that the, the it was what many would, would view diversified as far as that 60-40 split, uh, it still had a, an immense amount of risk. And so what we, we typically do is we have these, these positions uh, on to, to reduce the risk of the portfolio by, by having, having these, these defensive or uh, diversified positions in place. You can see that it, it did nothing for the portfolio uh, because we still came down to the same uh, contraction point down here at the very bottom of the market. And all we ended up doing is that, as you see right here, as we hit the highs back in 2007, uh, depending on what your, your temperament of the portfolio was, just simply reduce what your high water mark was. But we all came t to pretty much the same uh, point at the very bottom. Uh, maybe it was off one or two percentage points, but really each of these portfolios had the same significant pullback coming all the way back down here. Uh, one of the other things to keep in mind, you know, as, as you've mentioned, Bob, we've been in this range right here as the market's uh, just been trying to sort itself out. It's of course the components uh, within a strategy like the global equity strategy. The name itself should tell you what's in it. Uh, you know, we have more than just simply SPY in it. Uh, we have things like uh, emerging markets in it. We have IJR, MDY. Uh, so at this point, even though we are long SPY in this particular portfolio, that's only 20% of it. it it's, it's a great sign of the fact that you are diversified at this point because of all the other uh, positions that you would be diversified into, we currently are holding cash. Uh, whereas the market, you know, it has gone higher to hit new highs. Uh, the same proponents that, that, that preach diversification uh, at any other time, they would be saying you want to be diversified, but right now, just because this is the particular benchmark that has been hitting all-time new highs, that's what everybody's been talking about, although they would never advise that you would be solely 100% uh, invested in this particular benchmark. So it's sort of the love-hate relationship uh, that, that analysts have when it comes to uh, this particular benchmark. Yeah, and anyway, so we've kind of, uh, but I think this is important to understand that um, also that I realize that uh, a lot of folks are diversifying their clients and one of the the conversations that's always that we have that you folks have with with clients is that you know uh, how come we're not we're not keeping up with the with the market well when you when you've got all different types of asset classes and you have diversified you can see the more you diversify the less returns you're going to have and the unfortunate part which we saw in 08 which I've talked about for a long time is that in 08, 6040 was aggressive, and you can see it right here. And and that the only way to have averted any real downside was to get the cash. And I've argued for I don't know since uh, what is it, 16 years now. I've had this business uh, that cash is the only way to hedge your money on, on. And right now we have a lot of cash in there because there is even though the market printed a new high on Friday, there's still an awful lot of risk. So going back over um, to the, uh, let me go back over to the markets for final comments. And I need to get out of this thing. So going back over, take a look. We're, we're up around uh, the, the uh, 94, 98. Like I said, my, my best bet is here, we're gonna see some rally coming in. It's very possible that this cycle that was a high that comes in, this will be a high cycle as we come in to the next uh, couple hours on this five minute graph. And uh, we did see a, a reasonable spike here in the swing index, which suggests maybe that's usually when that spike happens uh, down in an extreme, will be within one or two hours of a low. So we may may have seen a little bit of a, of a, um, a bottom form here. Uh, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, the bottom has been 92.11. We are substantially below the extreme projected for today of 1997.30. So I think if we stay below that on the close today that we're likely to see this market uh, continue down and start to challenge some of these numbers that I talked about earlier. Uh, and the, the big number is 1978.50. 
and if the market breaks through there, uh, that's going to be that's going to be huge. But we're a little ways away from that, and maybe a couple of days. And uh, there's quite a bit of news coming out this week, so keep your eye on on the activity. Uh, we're, we'll continue at this time to to do the shows uh, on Monday and Friday as we have been doing them, and we will announce this market mind meeting, the market warriors. Uh, please send us your emails if you're interested in participating. Uh, you can get a trial from TradeStation, and I say, as I said, the, the criteria is 20 futures trades, uh, 50 options trades, and 5,000 shares in a given month, and they'll give you the platform for free. So if you use this for your own account, you, depending on your activity, you might be able to just get the platform for free, and depending on what service level, we'll be announcing uh, the access points for them from our viewpoint on, on what you can do with, with uh, the VPN market mind. So that's all the time we have today. So we'll be signing out and we'll see you on Friday as usual. And everybody have a great day and enjoy this downside. Thanks again.